So I'm just here with Richard from Glen Allocky. We spent three or four hours chewing the cut about all sorts of things. We talked a little bit about whiskey, but one thing I just really want to talk about is actually your the distillery because you drive here and it's building after building after building and you think it's just this massive operation but actually when you took it over you probably run it what a tenth of capacity it's just a little bit more than that so we're really fortunate we took a distillery that was existing that had a load of background to it and i'm, I'm sure that when you actually look at it it had built a reputation as a fantastic dram that was used in blends but also had the chance to really express itself and be really good in, in single malt. So we just said, right, let's come out of the, the, the blend area, let's focus on the single malt. And that's what we've driven forward with. So really we're about 20% now. Uh, we've gone up to 20% of the capacity, but that allows us to play loads of tunes. That allows us to just take the, the pressure off. We're not being driven by a financial position, trying to get a load of whiskey out. We're not driving for extra yield, we're just driving for quality and character. So really fortunate. And it's actually amazing the success you've had in the relatively short time that you've been here, that Billy's been here. Been here. And it must have been a, a monumental task walking into a distillery of all these thousands of casts which you've had no uh, control over, which were made to actually go into a blend, which is completely different than what's going into a, a single malt. Um, just sort of tell me a little bit about Billy's skill level, because I've, I've mentioned this before to other people, but a sushi chef takes like eight years to learn how to cut a bit of fish. Yeah. Can't grasp that. Someone blending whiskies, that's just another level altogether, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, we are very fortunate, there's no doubt. You know, Billy's owned his skills over um, many, many years, and he has a really good understanding. You, you touched earlier there, you said, you know, we came into the distillery with that history, but actually we're fortunate, we were able to pre-select a lot of the whiskey that was there to match our expectations. So it was first and second use bourbon, and that's really what you need. If you want to support or drive a really quality single malt, you need to make sure that the whiskey is at least that, going into that kind of wood. Mm. So we did that, then we used the expertise that Billy's developed over years, and we re-racked you know, countless casks over the last four or five years, or coming out for five years, I suppose, soon. Um, driving it forward to get to, to where we needed to be. You, you could tell, it's great, it goes into good wood, um, good first fill bourbon, delivers a lot of really interesting characters, allows the whiskey to mellow, but it gives it time, and there's no doubt about it, we needed time. We knew it was great whiskey, it was used in great brand uh, blends, and we, Billy and, and many of us had seen it before in the past, so many of the guys that came and got involved in the project thought, right, this is going to be a good whiskey. We're just nuancing it, finessing it. Whether it's new make that we've just slowly manipulated to just give even more character, or whether it's that experience that Billy had, choosing the right balance of cast to produce the 10, 12 and 15 year old Nicole range. That was important. But the warehouse team have been fantastic. The production team, you know, really focused on what they're doing. So, yeah, it's hard but it's really enjoyable. Yeah. There's two things we need to, to chat about. One is cast, which will come on in a little while, but actually we want to talk about the people because yeah. we were chatting earlier on and you're talking about your interview process. Just wanted to like, uh, just replicate, just go through that here. It's so, great. So we took the distillery on, but we gave the opportunity for everybody that was at the distillery to stay. So anybody that was working here and had been part of the, the previous um, ownership, we said, look, would you want to stay? And to a certain extent, most of them were so in, in, ingrained in the culture of the previous company, they wanted to stay with that. And you could understand it. But what that allowed us to do is really select people with a true passion for making the best they could and who understand and understood what we were trying to do. I was really fortunate. Um, hit the guy in charge of warehousing, Lindsay, I um, had opportunities, a few people got in contact with me, it's not so much we put adverts out, people actually knew we were taking over, got in touch with us and said, look, we want to be part of your project, we know what you're trying to achieve, we know that it's about the finished product, we know it's not about you know, the bottom line, it's not about the finance, it's more about the whiskey that we can make to give everybody an enjoyment of. He came down to see me and said, look, we'll meet halfway between where we live. 
So better meet at 10 o'clock on a Saturday because obviously we've both got uh, busy social lives and busy busy lives with work at the time as well. Met on a Saturday, I think three hours later, we're still chatting about all things whiskey. We're still still talking about how the cask and how this cask and how this uh, this aspect would in, uh, impact on the whiskey and what we would do and how we could get the best out of that and how we could drive forward. And, and, and basically, I remember he got a phone call from his wife and she's just like, oh, are you not home yet? And he was like, oh, I, I, we haven't even started the interview yet. So, you know, an hour later, he knew. I knew fine that, that he would be perfect for us. He had a real... Mm. What we wanted is people that were really passionate about what they do, people that really enjoyed it. And they're all ambassadors. Everybody that works here is an ambassador for us. And then you look at the production guys, it's the same thing. We've got these two guys. I, I, I looked around the industry and I found a guy that had a real history of working in different areas, doing different process support roles and working in labs and, and, and in production. So he had a really good knowledge of actual processes, the impacts of change, so that we could throw ideas out, him and I could bounce some ideas and he could be a bit sanguine about it and say, oh, I don't think that's going to work. And I go, no, no, we've got to try it anyway. So we, you know, we had a good idea of how we were going to change things and what the change would do. So there's no surprises. Sometimes there's a little surprise. Oh, I didn't think it'd be that good, maybe, but it was just something that was perfect for us. So I spent a bit of time with Philip and said, this is the project. He went back and talked to a colleague, explained what we were trying to do. I got a phone call from him saying, oh, I really want to be part of that. So the two of them came along and they, uh, we, we were really fortunate to get them. And we've done that at every level. So when you look, when we've been recruiting new guys in the warehouse, we started with one guy in the warehouse and myself pushing cats when we first started. And then we added another one because we needed more, then another one. And so every time we've done that, we've looked at people who, who are keen to learn, who are keen to understand, who want to develop themselves and also develop with us as a company. And you see that in the head office. To be fair, I don't interact with them all the time, but... You know, the guys that we were talking about marketing earlier, they are really keen to learn. So we had the marketing team up and, you know, the, the new people in there, we spent them, they spent a week engrossing themselves in there and in, in just, you know, in, in indulging their every um, desire to find out as much as they can. Because really they want to tell everybody what we're up to. And we've got all these lovely projects and lovely ideas and lovely cast that you talked about that we're trying to work with to try and get somewhere, you know. Yeah, and on to cars. We're talking about the, the bottom just up the road from the cooperage there, having sort of mostly ex bourbon. But you guys actually, you nose the cars as they come in, and you're also identifying at that that stage which are going to be the yeah. The ones. I mean, we we we've been also the size. We, we're you know we're relatively lucky that the size of production that we do, everything we're trying to achieve, we can actually spend a little bit more time on. It, it, it's not a and, and this is no disrespect to the, the big guys. They are fantastic at what they do. They work really hard to produce good, consistent quality. But when you've got hundreds and hundreds and thousands of cases, it's difficult to spend quite as much time as we have. So we looked and we've gone around the industry. We've said, what what companies can we work with that produce really interesting bourbons that we know are going to influence the whiskey and influence how it matures? So we're actually saying that. So we've got a band of um, suppliers of bourbon cast that we get through the cooperage that we're really happy with. We've got a band of suppliers of rye cast, which we think have a really good interaction with the whiskey and really really we know are going to help to mature it and we always give it time that's the one thing we say there's no substitute yeah. to time you need to give it time we've all talked about projects wrapping gas and in clean film hot hot storing and all these things yeah they're interesting but actually tried and tested works so mm. let's give it time we're fortunate enough we've got a hundred thousand casts on site we've got plenty of storage for the whiskey not all of the casts are ours but over the years as the as the pro profile and the product changes we'll have plenty of room to mature a whiskey and we all know that there's plenty for people to try. Which is actually really interesting why for distilleries such as, as yours that things are going to evolve. It's not going to be the same in 10 years time because obviously the distillation process you're changing, doing slur fermentations, yeah. various other things and also your cast management now. So really people if they can start almost building up a, a library of Glenallachy uh, vintage related whiskies to have a, a, a vertical tasting in 20 or 30 years time yeah, that's really interesting It'd be amazing I, I mean it, I think the, the whole industry is evolved I think if you go back and you look at the way whiskey was produced and what was driving it um, and you know things like the, the yeast that would have been used or the mix of yeast so it's always been changing 
And we feel that's very much the case with Glenallock. It's a journey, and we all talk about it. It's it's the journey the whiskey's gone. And it, it took a real big kick to begin with as we started launching batch one of the 10 year old and how that evolved and now it's gone into four, five, six, how that's moved on. And then you look at the 12 year old, you know, the first couple of expressions were really interesting, but now we're at a level where we're pretty consistent with what we're doing. And it's all down to sampling every single cast we're gonna use in a bottling, putting in pilot samples together. Billy will spend hours in the lab running through that, setting them all up, making sure, referencing previous batches. So yeah, it's really important what we're trying to do there. It, but yeah, you're right, it's a journey and it will continue to evolve. We're not, we're just nuancing. We're, you know, the, the quality of the spirit we, we, we inherited was absolutely fantastic. The actual whiskey that we're doing now, all we've done is we've tried to add a little bit of extra to the basket of flavours. We've tried to make it slightly more complex. And, um, esters, not the too light and fruity, just the sort of heavier esters that give a little bit more character and allow us to play more complex tunes with the wood, whether it's a virgin cask whether it's a, a Premier Grand Cru uh, wine cask, whether it's the classic um, sherry cask, all of that works well with a well-matured, you know, re interesting, robust whiskey. And just going on to a couple of questions about the, the stills. Um, one, that the stills actually have got a little bit of colour coding on them, which is quite interesting. I'd like to perhaps tell, tell people a little bit about that. So sometimes when you walk into the distillery, you'll see it in the, more, the older, more traditional distilleries, Customs excise used to insist everything was colour coded because one of the things the customs and excise officer who may have been uh, located on site but who may be new to the site wanted to be able to trace pipes. So it's nice and simple in the nomenclature. The red used to be the sort of wash, so you'd be able to ch yeah, chase the fermented product through, find the pipes that went into, and then obviously into the wash still. Um, and then obviously low wines and fence after the first distillation, that would be blue pipes. So it would be going there and you'd see how they would go. And then clearly as well, in, in, in an older distillery where it's really, you know, it's going through different rooms, it's going through, you could follow that and it would be black for that to do. And we just kept that going. I, ironically, I've just found out that uh, gas is the same. So we've got the gas pipe that we have because we moved to gas for the boiler. And um, that's also got to be right. coded. Um, and that's just a sort of mustard colour, but it's quite interesting because we were about to paint a different colour and then we had to um, actually change it back so that it was all there. So it's just standard, good practice. Yeah. It's one of these things. We, we pride ourselves on, on the condition of spending a bit of time, you know, bringing the fabric of the distillery up to as best as we can. So anybody who comes here is just obviously really impressed with what we do. They're big, bold stills, they're stocky. They've got, you know, broad shoulders, sort of short necks, which again lend through that heavier character. And then I'm sure you're going to talk about it a little bit, or I'm going to talk yeah. about it. We've got rather unusually for the industry, instead of having vertical condensers, we've got horizontal condensers. And that comes a little bit from the early design, from the original designer who said, look, if we've got vapour coming up and being boiled off the steel, some of the refluxing, some of that catalytic, the catalytic change from the copper, um, going into the, the condenser and then running back and forth and having slightly longer contact time because it's this direction and then through through into the um, subcooler and then into low winds or into spirit vat eventually um, but what that also did was allow them to to play a bit of a tune on temperature so we feel we've got slightly more control than perhaps would have been the norm in the industry i know new guys are getting or guys are getting better at that but that would allow us to change the from a, a deep, heavy character, maybe to push it towards the more estuary level, depending on what temperature we run the stills at. Mm -hmm. So fortunate, lo lovely little feature, saved energy in its day. So everything was high level. So you just open the vat, pour it into the next um, still, distill it again. You, uh, we were the, I think we were the first distillery that had wooden vats with um, pipes underneath, flow meters, and then it would just go straight into the the, um, um, the barrel. And then they would note the flow and the volume that went in rather than actually doing the old fashioned way they used to weigh them and say this has got this much weight increase so this is the much alcohol that's got in or this is the bulk that's gone in we would just do it like that things have changed now we're trying to be even more energy efficient so we put heat exchangers in the way so things have changed but the stills and the condensers are still the same orientation mm. which gives us this really nice character yeah and the still room actually looks absolutely amazing and um a little while ago um billy walker came into to where we are now and actually sat where you are and he sort of interrupted the conversation and he actually said you know richard it looks amazing in there absolutely amazing and i did because you look at the the the, the spirit safe you now and 
got some lovely wooden cladding. It looks absolutely amazing. It's immaculate. Yeah. Beautiful. I, I, again, it's, it's one of the things that if you've got people who are passionate about what they do, you know, the, nothing seems to be a chore to them. Although I have to say that Philip has problems sometimes when we have engineering work on site. If he's not done to his standards straight away, he can find it challenging. But actually it's quite nice to see because he just wants the best of what we're doing. So if we've got a project, we, we were doing one where we're changing the boiler feed tank um, and the guy's in there and he's going, come on guys, I need this to be done as quickly as possible, as neatly and tidy because we want to be able to showcase everything. And, and that's, if it's spirit quality, if it's the actual engineering, if it's the look of the place, and if somebody comes for a tour, even the guys downstairs, you know, the, the tour guys that we've got, they've been in the industry for a while, and it's not a standard tour, we don't feel. We feel that actually they're going to try and impart a little bit of knowledge or a little bit of their feeling about something. You know, we can all talk about science, fine. We can all talk about, you know, the, the basic process. But actually what you've got to say is, you know, what, why is it good for you and why are we enjoying it? This is part of it. You've got a great team. Yeah, absolutely. And what do you think that the future is? Obviously, I've only had that distillery for a few years. How will it? Do you obviously have the capacity to increase production? Is that in the in the pipeline? Are we actually quite happy keeping it quite compact? Yeah, we're fortunate. Without compromising the the, the setup that we've gone to, we can actually increase production and give us a, a reasonable amount of capacity. We've been slightly overproducing for what we we think we need going forward, just to be a little bit careful. But that's also um, part of the thing is I think you can see people now are more interested in older whiskies. If you do the right whisky, if you has if it's got the right complexity to begin with, it won't be over affected by the wood. It'll still be nice and balanced as a twenty one year old, a twenty five, a thirty or older. So you know these are we're hoping there'll be great expressions in the future. So maybe not my age, because um, maybe my son's age, but he's <laughs> looking at it. It'll be some fantastic whisky for people to try. That's got a real balance and real character. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, future. Yeah, we're going to slowly increase. We've seen phenomenal re response, mm -hmm. and we're so lucky. There seems to be a sort of passionate following who are willing to share what what they see and what they appreciate in the whisky and tell people about it, and that's helped to drive it. We've worked. Um, the sales and marketing team have selected and work closely with distributors who again, we talk about passion, we talk about drive, we talk about people who know the product uh, and understand what we can do because we're a little bit flexible. We're not defined as I said, it's not, there's a recipe for a 10 year old, there's, right, there's a little bit of flexibility but also we've got wood finishes, we've got virgin wood finishes, we've got, you know, um, next year I know we're talking about the sort of wine finishes we're talking about, we're talking about the four or five wine finishes as well. Mm -hmm. So all of these things all mount up. Our distributors need to be able to talk about that and get out to people and let them try it. Because actually that's what it's about. It's yeah. about somebody on a Friday night going with their mates going, do you know what, I'm going to open that and I know I'm going to enjoy it. Yeah. And then going, actually I'm going to do it again. We had a tour a couple of weeks ago at the end of the Spirit of Space side. I happened to be working late on a Friday and got in late I was going down the stairs, it was just about close of play, and these guys had done a tour, they'd had a great time, they'd gone into the shop, and they bought a couple of bottles, and they just opened one downstairs, and they just tried it, and then they tried it some more. And then, they went down to the uh, village in, in Aberlour, and they were sitting outside the bar, offering a dram to anybody that came by, and said, look, try that, that's just truly exceptional. And you know, that's the important thing, is opening it and enjoying it. I just, they, they were up from Edinburgh and I hope they had a fantastic weekend because they were just great fun downstairs. Yeah. They, were, they, they were asking a lot of very pertinent questions and it was lovely to answer that. I spent a bit of time before I had to leave and I just really enjoyed it. But they had a good tour. They, you know, they could see that they enjoyed it. They learned a lot about us and what our culture is and that's the important thing. So what, what was their best question that they asked you? Oh, that's harsh. So I, I, I think it was... It was it was based around the the reasoning behind the spirit space side um, whiskey and how it got to be where it was, and that's really about adding extra character. So if you know that that bottling, it's it's been for that number of years. We always try and mature, as I said, for seven, eight, nine years in that American standard bottle. Then we look to put it into sherry. Then obviously Billy had said we've been doing um, peated whiskey on site since we started. And that in itself provides us with loads of interesting problems. Where do you put the cut points? What wood do you put it in? How long do you leave it? But we actually moved on and we said, okay, we'll re-rack some of this. So we had some casts, so we then moved some more whiskey. So we talk about whiskey not just being left, it's a journey. Um, and they said, where, where did the idea come from? And I suppose we're, it's a difficult answer. It's just knowledge, it's just experience and just passion. You'll try stuff 
nothing's too unusual or nothing's too difficult. It came out and it turned out to be a really fabulous whiskey that I enjoyed. So, yeah, I, I yeah. thought that you know it was it was just a tricky one at the time to say why did you come up with that? And I think well probably Billy knew in his mind adding that extra dimension, that smoky Glenalicky hit onto the actual balance you got, just going to give you an enhanced one. So, uh, that was good. It's really interesting. I think that's a perfect way to, to end. Richard, thank you very much indeed for your, your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure being here at Glenalicky. Can't wait to come again. No, absolutely. It, it, as I say, it, it's really enjoyable. Somebody obviously enjoys the whiskey. Somebody obviously understands the industry. It's nice to spend some time with somebody like that. And we will come back next time. We're going to have some really nice wine finishes for you to look at. We talked earlier on about Premier Crew. We were fortunate enough to spend a bit of time. I've been fortunate enough to work with people to get different Premier Crew and we'll get a test, tasting organised and you can try the different finishes that they have on the whiskey. Something to look forward to. And again, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.